Welcome to this evening's presentation. Happy Candlemas, happy feast day. Thank you for being here. My name is Mark Mann. I'm the Director of Programs and Institutes for the Catholic Information Center. The ministry of the center offers opportunities for deeper, more reflective awareness of our faith for those who are already Catholic. And we also invite seekers from other faith traditions or no faith tradition at all to discover and dialogue with us about this way of life. We're a ministry of the Paulist Fathers at service to the Diocese of Grand Rapids, as well as beyond. And very happy to welcome Sister Diane Zerfus here as our presenter this evening. Uh, I wanna just take a moment to uh, offer as a reminder about the programs here at the Catholic Information Center that they are open to the public and they are donation-based. And so it would not be possible without your contributions and that of our friends and associates. We really appreciate your support and encouragement. It's indispensable. Thank you. You can also connect with us by signing up for our free newsletter. We send out every Thursday about upcoming programs, as well as watching videos, including tonight's presentation, which will be posted to our YouTube channel, and by following us on social media. Your help is a big part of everything we do. And of course, you're welcome to visit the Catholic Information Center. Let me take a moment to introduce Sister Diane, and then I'm going to turn it over to her for our opening prayer. Sister Diane Zerpas uh, is a Grand Rapids Dominican sister. She holds a bachelor's degree in math, chemistry, theology, and education from Aquinas College, a master's degree in arts from, uh, and religious studies and pastoral studies, and a specialized certificate in parish life and administration, uh, and a certificate in spiritual direction. Sister Diane has ministered in many ways, including teaching high school, serving as a formation director for her congregation, uh, initiation and evangelization director at a parish ministry, as well as in diocesan positions, and uh, is currently the coordinator of the Dominican Center's Spirituality Center. And Dominican Center at Marywood has just moved to Aquinas College and are exploring new opportunities for contemplative prayer shared study, community building, all for the sake of service in their new location. Please help me welcome Sister Diane Serkis. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. And um, it's nice to be um, in a Zoom location that I'm not responsible for. We'll let Mark worry about all of the details of how things work. Um, to kind of give you a little um, overview of what we're going to do this evening, um, it's always nice um, for me to um, make sure that there's like kind of an outline so that even if um, I'm telling stories, just to know that I have a plan and um, we will get to all of those pieces. So we're going to begin um, with a prayer and then a little reminder of what Lexio Divina is. And then we're going to do a Visio Divina using um, two of the frescoes uh, Fra Angelico. And then um, I'd like to do just a little biography, a little of Fra Angelico's life um, and um, uh, how he ended up at a place where his art was preserved. And then uh, a little YouTube video with a couple of art historians walking through San Marco. So you'll have um, a walking tour from two people who um, have an eye for beauty. Um, and then we'll conclude with another um, of prayers with Fra Angelico's frescoes. So that's our evening. And we're going to um, begin um, this evening as we take a look at light and beauty, particularly on this Feast of Candlemas. I have to admit that when I was a child, I always thought that we had the blessing of all those boxes of candles on February 2nd, so that the blessing would be fresh for the blessing of throats for St. Blaise on February 3rd. And I had terrible sore throats and tonsillitis when I was a child. And so this was a very important prayer to me because that was always my prayer. Please don't let me have too many sore throats this year. So um, Candlemas reminds us of our need for light, particularly um, not just the physical light, although we need that, but also that inner light, the beauty that can surround us and remind us whose we are in the beauties of creation. 
So I'm going to begin um, with a prayer from the Liturgy of the Hours for the feast day of um, Fra Angelico. Um, his official name is Blessed John or Giovanni of Fiozole. God of eternal beauty, in your providence, you inspired Blessed Fra Angelico to reveal in images of earth the tranquil harmony of heaven. With the help of his prayers and by following his example, may our lives reveal the same splendor to the hearts of all our sisters and brothers. May we delight in the beauty of his work and rejoice in the glory of your creation. And we ask this in the name of Jesus, our Savior and the light of the world. Amen. So as we begin um, this evening, um, I want to, um, perhaps we could, Mark, move to the um, PowerPoint. The, if we were in person, I would just um, hand you <laughs> the handouts. Whoops. Okay. This is a reminder of the prayer of Lexio Divina, fancy Latin that means holy reading. The thing that's lovely about Lexio Divina is a, it's a very simple prayer, and it's a prayer that you can take with you, that you can do individually or you can do in groups, and that's what we're going to do tonight is the, the group experience. But Lexio Divina reminds us that the word is just waiting for us. And the passage that we're going to use tonight is from Romans chapter 10. And this is a beloved reading from, um, for Dominicans. Um, and as you hear it, I'm sure you will recognize why it um, is so important to us. The power of the word of God and letting the word, a word, choose us, helps us in our prayer. And so we're going to have um, an opportunity to practice Lexio Divina. So I'm going to read the passage four times. And the first time, just kind of take it in. It might be a maybe a little new translation for you. It's taken from our um, prayer book, um, Dominican um, Praise, which we um, published a number of years ago and is popular among the English-speaking Dominicans around the world. And so in the passage, the first time you just take it in, what's there? The second time you let a word or a phrase kind of jump out at you. And I will ask you if you would like to speak that word aloud. It doesn't matter if you um, overlap or if you use the same word. Um, if you would just unmute yourself and voice that word. What happens then is in our community, we fill the space between us with the word of God. It has a power to permeate who we are and how we are. After reading it the third time, I will ask again, was there a word or phrase that moved you to your center, to your heart? And then after the fourth reading, we'll just take a moment of silence. Let the word that shows you, pull you deeper into the love of God. You and God with the word between you, drawing you to each other. And then we'll see if there's any fruit of your contemplation that you might be interested in sharing. So this is from Romans chapter 10. How can people call upon Christ in whom they have not believed? 
And how can they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching? And how can people preach unless they are sent? As scripture says, how beautiful are the feet of those who announce good news. So therefore, faith comes from hearing and hearing comes from the word of Christ. So in our second step of the prayer, we listen for a word that touches our ear. How can people call upon Christ in whom they have not believed? And how can they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching? And how can people preach unless they are sent? As scripture says, how beautiful are the feet of those who announce good news. So therefore, faith comes from hearing, and hearing comes through the word of Christ. As you meditate on this passage, was there a word or phrase that you would like to share? Faith comes from hearing. Preach. How beautiful. The word of Christ. And as we pray the third time, we listen with the ears of our heart. How can people call upon Christ in whom they have not believed? And how can they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching? And how can people preach unless they are sent? As scripture says, how beautiful are the feet of those who announce good news. So therefore, faith comes from hearing, and hearing comes through the word of Christ. And is there a word or phrase that resonates in your heart? How? The word of Christ. Faith. How beautiful. Sent. 
Let us rest in the silence, in the peace of contemplation, open to us through these words. How can people call upon Christ in whom they have not believed? And how can they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching? And how can people preach unless they are sent? As scripture says, how beautiful are the feet of those who announce good news. So therefore, faith comes from hearing and hearing comes through the word of Christ. So as we begin our evening exploring the light of Fra Angelico, we hear this blessing taken from the letter to the Romans of how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But I think certainly St. Paul would encourage us to look at all of the body of Christ. How beautiful the feet but also how beautiful the hands, especially those with artistic fingers. How beautiful the mouth that voices the word of God and how beautiful the eye that sees beauty and can share it with the world. There's a Dominican book written by a Venturino Elsie called, one section of it is referred to as the homilies of Fra Angelico. And this is a quote. Admiration for the religious artist has turned our attention to the friar preacher who used color to proclaim to women and men the gospel of salvation. Fra Angelico, faithful to his Dominican profession, was first of all an excellent preacher. The word of God can be proclaimed directly from pulpits of churches or from professors' chairs by writing and publication, but also, in particular cases, by the language of art. From the theological point of view, there do not exist any differences between the different modes of preaching the word of God. All is powerful. All is beautiful. All announces the good news of salvation. So thank you all for enjoying the power of the word of God in words. But now we're going to move to Visio Divina. And if you would move us, Mark, to the next slide. And in, this is a new method of prayer for you. I thought I would put a little more description of it. Visio just means visual, like Lexio Divina is holy reading. Visio Divina is holy looking holy seeing, seeing with the inner eye. And so to prepare ourselves, we just kind of, um, we're going to close our eyes, breathe slowly, and kind of clear our minds so that ooh, when the picture comes to us, it's fresh and new, even if it's something that's familiar to you. Um, and you can do this with icons. You can do this with any great art. You can do it with pictures of nature. 
Visio Divina brings the eyes into our prayer. And so that first step of listening uh, becomes opening your eyes and just scanning the image. Look at the picture and see what draws your interest, but just keep moving around the picture so that you see it as a whole. And then we will look a second time. And in the same way that we used our ear to see what jumps into the ear of our heart, letting a word or phrase resonate within us. And that second step, where does our eye move? Um, what attracts us? What pulls us into this? What did I notice? What's there that's special and unique? It's one point of the picture. Maybe the, um, maybe a flower, maybe an eyebrow, uh, maybe an architectural detail. Where's the point that we're drawn into this painting? And then we move again, letting our eye choose a particular piece of this image and see what it says to you. What's the message that this part of this piece of art is saying? What's the revelation of God as you and God sit in this piece of prayer? What is coming to you? And then contemplatively, breathe in the beauty and enjoy and appreciate the power of what you discover in this point of the picture. So it's a simple process um, using your eye to be drawn into a piece of art. And rather than trying to absorb all of it, to let a little piece of it be a, an invitation to go deeper into the art. So um, Mark, if you would move us to the fresco. We're going to focus on the artistic detail that we see surrounded by the architectural detail. As you can tell, it's part of a much bigger piece, but we're looking at the center of this reality. We're looking at Jesus hanging on the cross. And we're looking at St. Dominic kneeling at the foot of the cross. So, we let our eye travel around the painting. What do we see here? What design, what color? Have you ever stood at the foot of a cross? There might be a memory or a reminder. Perhaps you had the opportunity to visit the Holy Land and go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Perhaps you sat at the bedside of a beloved person as they died. Let all of that flow through you as you examine this painting. And secondly, we invite you to look more closely. You can lean in if you would like. What captures your eye? What detail? Perhaps the blood dripping down, perhaps the wound in Christ's side, perhaps the halos. Perhaps the person of St. Dominic. 
let one point of this painting pull you into a prayer. And then close your eyes and pray. And then in the third step of our prayer, look again at the painting and see if it's the same detail that draws you in or perhaps a different one that jumps out at you this time. And look deeply into that spot to see what is being revealed to you. And then closing your eyes and letting that detail stay with you and have a prayerful conversation. with what is the meaning? What do you discover from what you found in this painting? Meet God. Be in this piece of art with such a profound spiritual meaning as the crucifixion. So would anyone be willing to share with us what piece, what point of this artwork jumped out at you? What did you see when you looked more closely? Um, what I saw was the, the fluttering of Jesus's uh, garment, and maybe that was added after the initial painting, I don't know, but that fluttering, that movement, in spite of everything being so still and motionless, uh, just struck me as, as something, something in there. Mm -hmm. It might be a good place to reflect on the movement of the wind outside, perhaps the movement of the spirit mm -hmm. being sent out into the universe. That's lovely, Fran. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm touched by the look on Dominic's face, especially his eyes. Jesus dying on the cross seems quite peaceful, <laughs> but Dominic looks like he's in anguish. And you can almost feel him wanting to take the pain away from Jesus. That in his meditation, of being at the foot of the cross, 
He wanted to free Jesus from pain, the pain of our sins, which might be Fra Angelico's way of saying, this is why Dominic wanted to preach, to take away the pain of our sins. Any other observation? I was struck by the horizon. Mm -hmm. um, I think of the crucifixion. I think of, you know, the sky turning like night, uh, which is, the sky is dark, but at the horizon, at the point where heaven meets earth, the, the blue is brighter. Um, and uh, the earth is white, not, not brown, um, like I would have expected. Um, and it seems to me there is a kind of a, a baptismal uh, theme there uh, where the heaven, heaven meets earth and, and the blood drips down onto the white uh, pedestal. Mm -hmm. Well, I was struck by um, the way that Dominic holds the cross, which um, in gives me the feeling of tenderness and love that he has for Christ and just how gently um, and tenderly he's, he's uh, holding that cross to me conveys uh, profound and deep love for Christ. I could hear um, the echo um, a few centuries uh, or a few countries away of Ignatius of Loyola, um, writing like a hundred years later. Uh, he, in his prayer, stood at the foot of the cross and he asked, what have I done for you, Christ? What am I doing for you, Christ? What shall I do for you, Christ? So as we um, take a look at Visio Divina, this, as you walk into San Marco, this is the first painting that, that hits you right in the face. Um, in the entrance portico, this is what you run into first. So I think it tells us something about how important um, Fra Angelico saw this painting that it would be the first thing that hits your eye when you enter San Marco. Okay, let's take a look at the second one. And we're going to do a, the same kind of reflection with one of his famous annunciations. So let your eye travel around this painting, just kind of absorbing all of the details and the color and the location of Mary and the angel Gabriel. And then close your eyes. and prayerfully open them and see where your eye moves. What catches you? What detail becomes the center of the meaning, the moment of this painting? What do you see? And closing your eyes, give yourself a moment to look again with fresh eyes. Is your eye still drawn to that same point 
or perhaps there's a different place that catches your eye. And prayerfully, in contemplation, meet God at that point, asking what is being revealed to me in this place, in this moment. And letting the beauty of that point pierce your heart. And would anyone be willing to share what point in the painting caught their eye, caught their heart? And for me, it was the little tiny window way in the edge of the building which is kind of between the two faces of Mary and the angel, which kind of pulled me deeper into this moment, wondering what's on the other side of that window. Is it an inner garden? Is it another room? What more is there in this place? Any other pieces that you'd be willing to share? Well, sister, admittedly, I was a little distracted at first because Mary has the same kind of fence I do in my backyard, and I didn't know they had those kind of fences in the <laughs> ages. But... But the point in the painting that drew my attention was at first was Mary's hands in the same posture as that of Gabriel's. Uh, but then in looking at the second time, it was actually her eyes. And it was this, I imagine it's the moment before she says her, yes, let it be according to your will. But there's that dawning recognition like, oh, and this is going to change everything. This painting is um, at the top of the stairs if you were going up to the bedrooms in San Marco. And it's huge, you know, it's, it's um, I don't know what the dimensions are, but it's like the whole wall as you go up this double stairway. And you think of, of the novices going up there, you know, time after time, day after day. And what um, Frangelico said to them, which to me is amazing, um, when you, you climb these stairs and you see the Annunciation, stop and pray a Hail Mary. And I thought, well, that's kind of holy. But then Frangelico said, and then say, may the word of God be enfleshed in me. May the word of God be enfleshed in me. And what's amazing to me is that he's writing this about 1450, 
Um, and it didn't have anything to do with um, gender because all of the novices around him were men. May the word of God be enfleshed in me. I had the wonderful opportunity um, to go uh, listen to Rick Steves last week when he was <clears throat> at the Calvin um, January series. And um, this is his reflection on this Fra Angelico. Fra Angelico's Annunciation. This is really big news. The Archangel Gabriel enters crossing his arms in greetings, fans his colorful wings and announces to Mary that she's about to give birth. Mary does not exactly look overjoyed. Annunciation scenes like this were popular throughout European art history because they captured that crucial moment of incarnation, the moment when God became human. Annunciations were a Fra Angelico specialty. His unique contribution was placing the scene in a casual and realistic setting. Fra Angelico created this for a monastery in Florence, San Marco. He was himself a monk there, even serving as prior. He decorated the monastery with religious scenes for the contemplation of his fellow brothers in Christ. In fact, this particular scene would have looked remarkably familiar to the monks, the painting's columns and arches look much like their own monastery. Fra Angelico brought the heavenly scene home to his monks, quite literally. The Annunciation was placed at a well-traveled spot at the top of the main staircase. Paintings like these, while world famous today, were meant only for the private eyes of a few humble monks. Painted around the year 1450, the painting captures the glorious time when medieval piety seemed to dovetail perfectly with the budding humanism of the Renaissance. In traditional fashion, this Annunciation is filled with medieval symbolism and everyone dutifully wears their gold plate halos. On the other hand, Fra Angelico was exploring the Renaissance revolution in 3D. There's a clearly defined foreground with the columns, background of the trees, and the middle ground where Fra Angelico places his figures. There's also a clear vanishing point. The line of columns leads the eye to the tiny window in the back, giving a glimpse of a wider world beyond. Fra Angelico brought this holy scene into our real world of grass, flowers, and trees. Though an ascetic monk, Fra Angelico refused to renounce one earthly pleasure, his joy in the natural beauty of God's creation. Fra Angelico's colors are a harmonious blend of pink, blue, gold, and green. In person, if you sway back and forth, the angel's wings actually sparkle. That's because Fra Angelico added multicolored glitter to the fresco. Fra Angelico joined the Dominican order and he was given the nickname of Fra Angelico, meaning angelic brother. He earned a reputation for sweetness, humility, and compassion, not just because he painted angels. And in 1982, he was beatified by Pope John Paul II. For Fra Angelico, painting was a form of prayer. He created an ethereal world that's perfectly lit with no moody shadows, one that seems to glow from within like a stained glass window. He shows us the miraculous, but it seems completely real, like it's happening before our very eyes. Or to put it another way, he shows us the beauty of everyday things and makes it seem miraculous. I didn't know that Rick Steve had all of this lovely poetry within his soul. So as we begin our exploration of Fra Angelico, we've stood at the foot of the cross with St. Dominic, and we've observed a message from angels to Mary. 
And as we explore these pieces, we have a sense of seeing his own personal theology, his preaching for each of us. I'd like to give you a little um, of the history of um, Fra Angelico, kind of a overview. He was born about the year 1400 in Fiozzi, Fiozzoli, which is a little town just um, near Florence in Italy. He was originally a miniaturist, which means he painted those little tiny jewels that would go in, in documents and um, scripture, um, kind of like illustrating like the first letter of the scripture passage. Um, if you've ever seen any of the Book of Kells or even the new translation that the St. John's Collegeville is doing on scripture, the, um, the power, the beauty of those tiny little jewels um, can really jump out at us. He became a Dominican um, around the year 1420 and he was already an artist um, and he entered the Dominicans with that history. His older brother also had that same artistic bent and entered the Dominicans as well. In 1436 um, from Fiozzoli, he was invited to move to San Marco in Florence. And um, he spent um, a number of years there before he was called to Rome. Um, and primarily he um, painted um, his own home, the, um, the San Marco um, Monastery that's located right next to the Church of St. Antoninus. In taking a look at um, his own personal spirituality, we don't have a lot of, we have his artwork, but we don't have a lot of what he said or what he wrote. But the one line that is attributed to him is, to paint the things of Christ, one must live with Christ. And I think that's what gives us a sense of why he was called Fra Angelico, his person and his own personal spirituality. He um, was buried in the Dominican church in Rome where he had been called by the Pope to come and work on the Vatican. And um, he's buried at the church of Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, um, which is also where Catherine of Siena um, is buried. And um, it's interesting that there are two epitaphs um, near his tomb. One of them um, encourages us um, to celebrate that um, quote that we have from Venturini at the beginning um, from the homilies and also um, This was on the wall next to his tomb. The glory, the mirror, the ornament of painters of Giovanni the Florentine is contained within this place. A religious, he was a brother of the Holy Order of St. Dominic and was himself a true servant of God. His disciples bewail the loss of so great a master for who will find another brush like his? His country and his order lament the death of a consummate painter who had no equal in his art. And on the marble tomb, it reads, here lies the venerable painter, Fra Giovanni of the Order of Preachers. Let me not be praised because I seemed another artist, but because I gave all my riches, O Christ, to you. For some works survive on earth, and others in heaven. And the city of Florence, flower of Arturia, gave me Giovanni birth. It's such an Italian thing to say. When we take a look at um, the artwork that um, Fra Angelico left us, um, he, became, <coughs> he began as a miniaturist and then expanded into doing altarpieces particularly for outdoor shrines. Um, the famous one has the Virgin and Child and then 12 um, musician angels with their different instruments um, surrounding the picture. And um, you often see these in Christmas cards. But when he was called to San Marco, he really came into his own. 
he painted the hallways, he painted the refectory, the dining room, he painted in the library, um, and he went upstairs to the 44 bedrooms um, and painted there, which would only have been a prayer for the individual monk who lived in that room. Um, some of them, um, over the years, you can tell Fra Angelico did himself, and others were done by his students. But there is a feeling about um, his artwork that permeates. Then he was called to the Vatican and worked on the Pope's private chapel and was called to Orvieto um, and painted the inner dome of a chapel at the cathedral there. Um, Dominicans have a, a special feeling about the Orvieto, which is where Thomas Aquinas um, first performed his uh, liturgy of Corpus Christi. His last work, it seems, was a series of panels on a silver chest for the Church of the Annunciation in Florence. And it was the life of Christ. And each of them had a biblical inscription from the Old or the New Testament, which says to me that perhaps he still had that feeling of being a miniaturist, of trying to capture the beauty in one word, in the word of God. So in taking a look at um, Fra Angelico's life, um, to give you a sense of what San Marco um, is like, we have a short YouTube of um, a couple of art historians um, walking around San Marco. And then I'll tell you a little bit about my experience of being at San Marco. And um, we're hoping that our technology will work. The um, two artists uh, who are uh, walking around are uh, Dr. Zucker and a Dr. Harris. We're in the large complex that is the convent of San Marco in Florence, and we're standing in one of the cloisters. It's a beautiful space with frescoes in all of the lunettes and a large fresco by Fra Angelico of the Crucifixion. The monastery itself is Dominican, and that is one of the begging orders. This is a space where people would have given up their worldly possessions and traded them in for a life of prayer and solitude. And it's a famous place largely because this is where Fra Angelico spent most of his life and where he painted a whole series of frescoes that we're gonna go take a look at. As we walk past a second cloister on the left and the refectory, which includes a large fresco by Ghirlandaio of the Last Supper. If we walk up the stairs, we pass numerous family crests of the Medici, which reminds us that they were the dominant patrons of this convent. And in fact, Cosimo de' Medici had a cell of his own that he used on occasion. When we get to the top of the stairs, we can see down two long hallways. About every 10 or so feet, there is an opening with a small wooden door into a small cell that would have been a space for a monk to sleep, but also a place for prayer and meditation. And on the walls are frescoes by Fra Angelico and his followers. This must be freezing in the winter. There's no insulation whatsoever. No. Let's turn our attention to the large fresco at the top of the stairs, though. It's really a masterpiece. This one is quite large and has figures that are life-size. It starts about four feet off the ground, so we look up at the scene of the Annunciation. But it also allows us to see this fresco much more close up than we'd normally be able to in a large, say, basilica environment. That's true. We're not far away the way we might see an altar. It's just a beautiful image, but it's also very spare. And the spareness seems to really be fitting for this monastic space. Right, and the actual loggia or open porchway space that the Madonna and the Angel Gabriel occupy seems to match the cloister that we were just in and the windows that we see around us. We see in the room behind Mary. So it really feels as though Mary and the Angel Gabriel are in a space very much like the one that the monks themselves inhabited, which must have helped them to think about this moment of the Annunciation. This is the Annunciation. Our Archangel Gabriel has appeared to Mary to announce to her that she'll be bearing God. Now, what's interesting is that in 
many paintings of the Annunciation, you would expect to see a lot of other kinds of accoutrements. You'd expect to see white lilies as a symbol of her virginity. You would expect to see her having been interrupted reading the Bible, expressing her piousness. And some art historians have suggested that some of these symbols are missing because the monks already know the story well. This painting doesn't have to be as didactic as it might have to be if its audience was a lay audience in a church. It gives room to the monks themselves to fill in the rest of the story for themselves, and I think that's one way in which it was an aid in prayer. It was so simple and so spare, not only this fresco, but the ones in the cells too, that it would not interfere with the monks' own imaginings. There's two things that I think are worth pointing out, which is understanding this fresco within the context of these hallways on the second floor of the monastery. For one thing, as we look down the hallway, we see doors that are too small for this space. And there's a kind of interesting relationship between the receding doors and the receding orthogonals that we see down the hallway on the left and the loggia, the columns on the left, is leading to a doorway that is visually too small also. Mm -hmm. And so there's a nice complement that exists there. The other thing is that the vanishing point seems too high and the floor seems to be too steep. But when you look at this fresco as you ascend the staircase, that makes more sense. You're seeing it at an extreme... From far below. That's right in an oblique angle. And so I think it's really important to understand this painting, not in the isolation of a reproduction, but spatially in the context of San Marco. Mm -hmm. I think that's true. There's really no atmospheric perspective. So that raises another interesting issue here, which is there's real ambiguity in the space of this painting. You've got that flatness on the left side, this insistence on the two-dimensionality of the forest, of the lawn, and then there's ambiguity on the right side as well. There is some reference to linear perspective, but at the same time, the figures are much too large for this space. Right. If Mary stands up, she's going to hit her head on the <laughs> yes. ceiling. For Masaccio, the space and the scale of the figures would really have to be perfectly aligned. I think that there are a number of ways that Fra Angelico is balancing competing needs. For example, if we think about light, which is one of the things that was so important for Masaccio just 20 years or less before this is painted, we do see light coming in from the left. Yes, from the upper left. And so when you look at the columns, they're clearly modeled. We can see shadowing on the right. And especially in the groin vaults. But I don't see cast shadows from the columns, so maybe there is a little bit of one in that one on the but left. very soft. But there is more of a shadow that Mary casts on the right. In the earthly sphere. And the angel Gabriel doesn't seem to cast a shadow. If you look at their halos, he's using those flat, round halos like mm -hmm. we saw in the 1300s and not those foreshortened halos that we see Masaccio use. There does seem to be a willful kind of historicizing in that sense or a kind of not complete acceptance of the fully earthly rendering that is so prominent in Florence in the 15th century and especially at this moment. It's almost totally aware of Masaccio and what we might call the most advanced humanist styles but also an unwillingness to go that far and holding to more conservative or traditional aspects in some ways. And it does seem to totally make sense, given the monastic environment that we're in, and also for Angelico's own spirituality. That kind of tension really speaks to these developing techniques as having a spiritual or even political dimension, and that these were things that could be chosen. There were lots of styles that were available in the 15th century in Florence, depending on a whole lot of things. There's also subtlety, for example. We were talking about the spareness of this painting. There are areas where the artist allows himself to, to really create a very decorative set of forms. For instance, look at Gabriel's wings. Not only are they just beautifully detailed, but if you look really carefully, and this is something that doesn't come across in photographs, he must have used a kind of mica or some sort of mineral that really catches the light. Because as you walk past this fresco, it picks up light and twinkles. It does. It sparkles a little bit, especially in the, the darker paint. Look at how Mary and the angel look similar. Both idealized, but a kind of lack of specificity. You know, the faces, although they're generalized, are very specific in certain ways as well, especially around the eyes, which are actually the most detailed part of the entire painting. You really feel, even though they're separated by this column, that their gazes meet and are locked in place. And the way that Mary bends forward a bit and 
accepts her responsibility that Gabriel's announcing to her. It feels very, very serious to me. Very solemn. So should we go and take a look at some of the cells? Sure. We're looking in one of the very small monk cells. It's a small dorm room, really. And what, what would you say? Maybe eight by ten feet. Ten feet, ten not even. Feet. It's very small, with a window and covered by a barrel vault. On the wall opposite the doorway is a fresco by Fra Angelico of another Annunciation scene. This time, even more spare. We don't have the garden that we saw in the Annunciation scene in the hallway. We have the Archangel Gabriel this time standing, Mary, on a small stool, kneeling. Although Although her body is so elongated, it's actually hard to tell where her knees would be, where the lower part of her body is. And like all the other frescoes in the cells, St. Dominic is included, although you can see he's very carefully put outside the space that Mary and the angel Gabriel occupy. Very much like we are as we gaze into this cell, so he's a witness as we're a witness. Exactly. He's in a way a kind of stand-in for us, a kind of way for us into the painting. I am struck by the way in which the architecture depicted within this smaller fresco is such a beautiful complement to the spare space that we're in. And to think about this as a painting that a monk would have lived with for much of his life. This is something that you would have gone to sleep with, that you would have prayed with, that you would have woken to. Mm -hmm. um, and that this was the single bit of ornament in this room. So the convent of San Marco is well known, not only for the extraordinary frescoes. You can Ron stop Pelican, it now, but... Mark. Thank you. Okay. So when we take a look at San Marco as um, the art gallery, um, we also recognize that it was a lived um, uh, home and that um, they were surrounded by beauty that would give them, I think, an appreciation of the word of God and calling them um, to preach. The um, lands of Dominic that I was privileged to participate in, um, the U.S. Dominicans organized different tours um, for a number of years. And we went to Spain, France, and Italy so we could see the trail of Dominic's life. And um, of course, we spent a little time in Siena um, for our dear sister, Catherine. And then we spent a day over in Florence. Um, walking into San Marco, there is just such a sense of the history of what's there. But it's a living history, even though at this point, it's more of a um, art museum than uh, a lived place. But you can tell that people lived there. Next to that beautiful painting of the crucifixion to the left is the door that goes into the church. And there's a little arched um, painting over the door where there is a monk inviting people to be quiet shh, as you go into the church. And I always thought that was, um, would be wonderful if you were working with high school students um, to remind them um, to be quiet as we went in church, into church. This is where I started teaching high school. Um, but the monk who was placed there is Peter the martyr. He was the first Dominican who was martyred. And um, uh, so whenever you see him, he has a huge um, blood all over the top of his head because he was uh, attacked by an ax. And um, it's kind of a gory rendition. But if this is the person telling you to be quiet, I think we also had a little sense of Fra Angelico's sense of humor. Okay, take this seriously, because um, look who's telling you to be quiet. The other place as we were walking along, um, we went into the uh, refectory, uh, the dining room, and there's a beautiful picture of um, the Mary and child. And I'm listening to the guide who's, um, he wasn't our guide, but he was just giving tours. And he's launched into, you know, what refectory means, et cetera, et cetera. But this was the point that I think he really captured for Angelico. He said, this guide, that um, the, the Madonna and child, mother and child, um, is an emphasis on the incarnation. And it's here in the dining room because it's just as important to remember the incarnation in the dining room 
as it is to remember it in the chapel. And I thought that here was a guide who really had captured the space, um, what was happening around. The other place that um, Fra Angelico has a really kind of surprising um, uh, painting was over the door to the infirmary, he painted the road to Emmaus. And one of the novices pointed out to Fra Angelico, these guys aren't going anywhere, they are really sick. And Fra Angelico said, oh no, they are on the most important journey of their life, the journey to eternity. So um, we might think that the paintings were just, you know, um, what would fit into this architectural detail. But I think that Fra Angelico did have some thought behind um, why he put paintings in particular places. This um, emphasis on his name of being Fra Angelico um, uh, has a history then of the angels, particularly in the Annunciation and the angels um, with all of their musical instruments. But um, in, within the, a century of um, Fra Angelico's death, um, his story was included in one of the biographies of um, Dominican blesseds and famous members of the family. And um, I appreciated that as they were doing the research of that, one of the authors went to visit with um, a monk who was in his 80s. And he didn't, I don't think, personally knew Fra Angelico, but he lived with people who did. And I always think that's kind of the, the strength of belonging to a religious family. Um, I didn't know um, uh, Mother Aquinata, who um, brought us here to Grand Rapids a um, hundred years ago, but I knew people who knew of her. Um, it's kind of the stories get passed down of what people are like. And so this is um, a couple of pieces from those biographies of within a hundred years of Fra Angelico's life. This one was published in around the year 1517. Fra Angelico was a simple man and most holy in his habits. He was gentle and temperate, removed from the cares of the world. He would often say that whoever practiced art needed a quiet life and freedom from care and that he should be focused on the things of Christ. I cannot bestow too much praise on this Holy Father who was so humble and modest in all his works and conversation, so fluent and devout in his paintings that the saints by his hand being more like those blessed be beings than those of any other. Some say that Fra Giovanni never took up his brush without first making a prayer. He never painted a crucifix when the tears did not course down his cheeks. And while the goodness and sincerity of his great soul may be seen in his attitude towards the figures, particularly of Mary and the angels. So we have some pieces of the Dominican memory of who Fra Angelico was. And so it's exciting to know that um, his art, uh, particularly that sense of, of letting the light, um, it was his, as they mentioned in the, um, the Annunciation, is he's not really um, putting in the sunshine. Uh, the light is not the sun, the physical sun. It's really the light of revelation that kind of permeates the gentle colors and the invitation of, of what's really there, that he's preaching through beauty. And so his paintings really encourage meditation. And that's exciting when we take a look at the relationship of the, um, the topic of the painting and us those of us who are the viewers. That's part of the power of preaching. You don't preach um, to an empty church. You preach to a particular congregation so that you have a sense of what are the questions? What are people asking? What do they need to know? 
And Fra Angelico did that with his artwork. What is it that people are asking for? What do they need? How can I help them see the beauty and power of God in their lives? So that's my um, experience of being at, at San Marco. Um, there also is um, uh, an awareness. Uh, one of the first places, um, the laborer is worthy of his hire, Fra Angelico and the um, Dominican that he worked with, St. Antoninus, um, did a, um, an explanation that um, artists should be paid, that they're worthy of um, making a living and it, their, their um, payment should not be determined by the size of their painting. Remember he was a miniaturist, little tiny pictures, but it should be based upon the quality of their work, the expertise of the artist and the investment of their time. Which um, when we think of you know, the beginning of the Renaissance, Okay, we certainly have famous artists um, coming into their own during this season, and um, the laborer is worthy of his hire. I'd like to do um, one more reflection, um, and this one is called The Mocking of Christ. So if you could pull that up, Mark, that would be helpful. This one. This is um, when you think this is painted in the 15th century. Um, it's really quite dynamic. Um, there are lots of pieces to it, and it's um, the mocking of Christ, the um, the beating of Christ. Um, it takes place before the crucifixion, but there's a real power in it. So let us prayerfully. Let our eye sweep across this painting and take a look at everything that's represented here. The meditation, the scripture that it represents, the person of Jesus, the person mocking, Mary, his mother, and Dominic. Mary was present possibly, at least near this event, and Dominic was 12 centuries later. And yet they're all present in this painting. So let us close our eyes and prayerfully Look for a detail, a point in this painting that draws us in, that speaks to us. And closing our eyes, we let that point burn within our consciousness so that we can see it even when our eyes are closed. And then opening our eyes, we let our gaze travel around and see where it lands, perhaps in the same place or in a new place. And closing our eyes, we let the inner light of our contemplation inform us, 
what we need to discover this day in this place. What is God saying to us through this work of Fra Angelico? And would anyone be willing to share with us what piece of this painting jumped into your mind? With the power of all of the hands, there are hands all over this painting. But my eye went to the hand of Jesus holding the stick, like it's supposed to be the scepter of mocking him that he's not a real king. And I just, as I look at the strength of that hand and the strength of that material, I think I'd probably be hitting that guy with a stick on the other side who was hitting me. And yet that's not what we see in Jesus's hand. There's a strength there, but not a strength for hitting back, for fighting back. Any other observations that you made? I was drawn to the blindfold and how his eyes were covered, but he could see what was in people's hearts. The, the two people and the people who were torturing him or mocking him. If we can see Jesus's eyes, can he see us? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was struck by the hem of his gown seeming to become one with the marble of the uh, floor. Um, kind of uh, that stony quality there uh, and a heaviness that I was not expecting. The throne, the throne to go with his scepter. Mm -hmm. The um, pieces of this, of, of the soldier spitting and the hands raised to beat him and the stick. And, and yet we look at Mary, it's almost as if her hand is trying to turn her face away. She who held all these things and pondered them in her heart that this was almost too much for her to ponder. And St. Dominic in his reading scripture is present um, at this event in the power of meditation and contemplation. Um, a number of years ago, um, one of my cousins contacted me and asked if um, I could um, give her daughter a tour of Marywood because she was studying monasteries and this was as close as they could find. So I gave them a tour and, um, and I gave the old names like refectory for dining room, et cetera. And um, as we walked around, um, this painting is particularly famous because there are lots of um, just the Saint Dominic, not the rest of the painting, but just the seated Dominic meditating. You, we have a number of copies of that. And so this lovely little sophomore girl said to me, 
you don't have very many pictures of that guy, do you? Because it's the same one all over. And I said, well, um, he lived uh, in the 13th century. So there weren't any cameras or anything. And, and this was a painting, you know, in the 15th century. Really? <laughs> I could see this was just amazing to her that um, we didn't have any pictures of this guy. So um, I, I think there were lots of things in her tour that were a surprise to her. But um, certainly the seated Dominic is a particular um, prayerful image for Dominicans um, so that our study of the word of God and our prayer with scripture helps us to be present at these events. After um, my my opportunity to visit the Holy Land, and I was still teaching um, high school classes, one of the students did say to me, when you talk about scripture, you sound like you were there. <laughs> and that to me was just a wonderful compliment. Because that's what study and meditation should do for us. And I think that's what the artwork of Fra Angelico does for us. It illustrates it in a way that says, you can be there. You can see the look on Mary's face. You can almost hear the words of the angel. Um, you can be at the foot of the cross. You can know that God is at work. And that's how Fra Angelico preached. And he particularly has a power of light, as we notice that um, the angel doesn't cast any shadow. So I'm wondering if there are any um, questions, um, any comments that anyone would like to make, anything that I went over a little too quickly that someone would like to uh, emphasize? Was that a hand waving there, Bob? Go ahead. Um, in that last picture, um, you're talking about Dominic being seated. One of the other things that struck me was there's a little red star, like an asterisk right above his head. I just yes. wondered if you had any thoughts or insights as to the meaning of that. Yes, there is a star. And in um, the, the legends um, of the stories of St. Dominic, um, that's always included there. And it's part of um, kind of the story of Dominic. Um, one part of the story is that his mother saw him as a little dog um, catching the with a, uh, um, a, a fire, a torch in his mouth, setting the world on fire. So that's one image. Sometimes you'll see St. Dominic with the dog. But also the star was a sign of um, his um, enlightenment of his seeing the light and the star journeyed with him. So often you'll see the star above St. Dominic's head. So thank you, Bob, for noticing. Are there other questions or comments or anything in particular that you, know, you wanna share that something that resonated with you uh, in your time of prayer? So I'm hoping that um, the experience of doing, especially Visio Divina, um, will help you um, explore Fra Angelico and other artists, as well as um, nature, um, taking a look at snowflakes, um, taking a look at um, uh, the light is slowly starting to return. And there is a week, I don't know which week it is in February, where we gain three minutes of daylight every day. So by the end of the week, we have an extra 15 minutes of daylight. Um, this um, was particularly, a, I think, a wise choice to take a look at the beginning of February to look for the light and to have a sense of um, the artwork of Fra Angelico kind of permeating um, the dark and cold of um, the physical world. But that's not the only real world. Sister Diane, thank you. Thanks You're so welcome. Much. Just a delight and, um, and real opportunity for us to grow. 
not only in our knowledge about Fra Angelico, but in our own experience of the light in our lives and, and the life of Revelation. So thank you for drawing those, connecting those dots. Good. For us. Thank you. So thank you. And, and, uh, yeah, and I also want to thank the members of the program team uh, for the Kenny Faith and Life series. This presentation is part of that series um, that's coordinated by the Catholic Information Center. And we are so glad that we have this technology that despite the weather, we can still gather and, uh, and explore the world of Fra Angelico and how that light still speaks to us today. Mm -hmm. uh, we hope that you can join us for uh, some of our future and upcoming events. Next week, we have uh, Dr. Jim Healy um, talking for, um, you, you don't have to be with your spouse, but it is about being married and still engaged. The secret of being <laughs> married and still engaged. And then on February 16th, Dr. Patricia Cooney Hathaway is going to talk about falling in love with God, uh, the journey of conversion and how that takes place over and over and over again in our lives. So, and details of all of those can be found on, and as well as registration can be found on our website, catholicinformationcenter.org. Sister, once again, thank you. You're Thanks welcome. For sharing your knowledge, your experience, and, the, and obviously the joy you have from, from your visit to San Marco. So. If you ever get to San Marco, enjoy it. <laughs> thank you all. Huh? Good night.